Hey everybody, what is going on? It is Aaron Trevino here and we have Trey from down in San Antonio. What's going on, Trey? Hey, how's it going? Just fine. Thank you for coming on. For sure. So uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, my name is Trey Serrano, <laughs> as, as you already said, Aaron. And um, so uh, I, was, I was raised pretty much in New York City. From New York City, I left went to San Antonio, Texas to become a police officer. So I was a police officer for eight years, three months, four weeks, <laughs> and three days, but who's counting, right? Uh, and uh, during my time as a police officer, I developed a real estate bris uh, business. So now we've sold, in th just in three years, I've personally sold over 100 properties here around San Antonio, to the coast, commercial, uh, have a team of eight realtors, and I also invest in real estate. Beautiful, beautiful. So kind of going back to when you were growing up, did you have anyone um, around you that, that did real estate or how did you kind of get into the industry? Because that's a different transition, you know? Man, that's a, that's a great question, Aaron. So I grew up in a very low income part of the, of the Bronx and the surrounding areas in New York. And nobody ever in the world reached out to me and said, hey man, this is not how you're, you should be living. You should not be in the hood. You should be middle class. There is more to life than the building next to you and the concrete on the street. And I wish somebody were to, were to tell me that when I was growing up. And <clears throat> I think that's the fire and motivation that I have and I've grown a business, uh, very successful, thank the good Lord. And it's just, I wanna reach that kid that is just, you know, somewhat in a, in a lower income area that has no hope. And, and so anyway, that's why uh, I, I started in real estate because it really gave me the financial freedom. You know, I was in public service before I was a cop, I was a paramedic, you know, working the ambulance for, I don't know, six years or so. So I always had public service. I always loved to help empower people. I loved working lower income areas because I can relate. I've been there. So, um, that's, that's kind of my niche, but it really was an accident how I got into real estate. <clears throat> so I had a realtor <laughs> that we hired. Hope she's not watching this. <laughs> Her name is, I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> but she did a horrible job. I wanted to punch that lady in the throat. I would never, but it was sleepless nights. She didn't get back to us. So I was, was so distraught over our, our, our that, that what happened to us so you know what I, I just said I, I'm not going to um, I, I'm not going to let this happen to us again let me get my realtor's license and I'll help friends and family I didn't really know too much about it I bought and sold some properties with realtors so anyway short story long right I uh, I got my realtor's license and man I hit the ground running first six months I closed 10 properties first year I closed 20 Second full year, I closed four, uh, 55. And then this is my fourth year. I'm, I'm already past 30 or so. Just in, we're in July, so about 30-ish. Not including my investments. Wow, absolutely. You know, I, I find that really interesting because there's always kind of a, everyone's wanting the quick fix. Everyone's wanting that little short spurt of motivation. But it seems like you had something deep that kind of, you know, pushed you forward. Yeah, you know, uh, in, in being a police officer, and I'm not gonna be on my high horse or anything, but when you're, when you're given an opportunity or if you're there to help somebody, you need to do it right there. Do not wait, do not stop. Uh, just there, if, if, especially if a superior or somebody tells you, you need to go here and you need to get that guy or girl, you know, th there's no thinking. So it really is about mindset, man. If I could be on this channel for an hour, I can tell you about mindset because that's all it is. I am not brighter than anybody watching this. I'm not, um, you know, gifted with anything. I just, I just have relentless um, kind of drive to get where I need to go because I've eaten dirt. You know, I've, I've grew up and I, and I would never want my family I have a wife and two kids, a three-year-old and a four-year-old. I would never want them to go through what I went through. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, um, 
it's interesting the kind of the dichotomy you have of you know remembering what the Bronx was like to you know you even talking about how no one had showed you hey there's more there's more to life than this concrete so what was kind of you know was there any particular moment where you had this aha moment and you kind of shifted the mindset a bit yeah so uh the, the, in my high school guidance counselor told me he said son you should you should really learn how to paint and i said what the and I, as a high school kid i had no idea what he was saying but you know what he was saying is hey man you need to learn how to do something and painting is probably the easiest thing so you need to do it and i'm not demeaning anybody who paints because my father was a handyman he was a janitor i had the world of respect for him or i still do uh so that is not it it's just it's it's funny how just because i was in a social economic class i uh was a certain way and it just school did not fit my persona it didn't fit my mind my mindset i needed more so um from that motivated me motivated me to said no nah, this isn't right one of the most pivotal moments in my life was when I was in credit card debt, just like everybody else, just because I was a police officer making good, good money, uh, working overtime, it was still not enough. And I could not figure out why in the hell am I working so much? And it's like running on a treadmill, right? You are, you're going, there's nothing stopping you, but you're still stationary. So then I started doing what you, what the viewers are doing now is they're watching you, uh, Facebook groups, YouTube, uh, podcasts, just the ivory tower just is no more in 2020, especially when I started in 2016, you know, F that now it's, I'm going to share all my secrets. I want you mother efforts to win. I want you to, to buy things, make money and teach me because I truly believe whoever's watching this is going to be better than me. And I want them to, because then once you're better than me, now you can teach me uh, so I don't make, you know, as many mistakes. So when, and I'm sorry, the pivotal moment was when I first started real estate and, and investing and seeing the benefits of compound interest, leverage, uh, having basically formulas of calculated risk. And those things, I was like, what the hell? No, no, no. We're whole lives. We've been taught to work W-2 jobs get a paycheck and, and provide for your family. And, and this whole retirement thing, nah, man, I, I don't believe in it. I'm not going to change at 50. I'm still the same freaking driven animal that I am now. And, I, and I'm not going to stop. So a uh, pivotal moment was when I started learning about investing and seeing a result. Yeah, absolutely. You, you touched on a good point there, kind of, um, you know, kind of breaking it down a bit and having those goals you know, what would you say to someone who's kind of starting at square one, they know they want to get started, um, or kind of having, um, you know, their mindsets kind of wavering a bit, they're trying to get themselves straight. Um, what, what would you suggest? A very, very great man told me this, and he's heard it from somebody else who's heard it from somebody else. You know, he said, Trey, it is not timing the market. It is your time in the market. And I'm, I don't know who said it, and I'm not trying to <laughs> plagiarize or anything, but it really is stop worrying about your mistakes or this or that. You know, we make mistakes every freaking day, every year. We're paying W-2 taxes, and, but it's okay. It's like, oh, I made 100,000 this year in my W-2 job, and I paid 40 grand in taxes. Um, but I'm scared to buy a house or I'm scared to invest in, in gold and stocks. You need to realize what you're doing. You're losing money every single year, but that's okay. But changing a water heater or, you know, potentially ripping up carpet is like, Oh, oh my God, that's a risk. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. It, it kind of seems like, um, you had you you almost had this neat perspective from a young age because even you yourself said how you know you went through high school your counselor mentioned how hey you maybe you should consider you know learning how to paint but at that point even when you were much younger you knew that school wasn't wasn't your place no you know what i would say most of the time school is trash 
It is not a, a good place for people. It is fixed. It is, there's a ceiling to it and it is not innovating whatsoever. I mean, where I came from, there was zero dollars for college, zero. And even a, a I mean, I'm gonna knock myself a dumbass kid. I could not be, I wasn't smart enough to even do a loan application to take out student loans. The smart being that I was like, why am, you know, kind of a grunty, I'm kind of grunty. Why am I gonna fill out all this paperwork to, to get a $60,000 loan? Like, I don't wanna do that shit. I'll just, you know, just, I don't know, pick up a trade or something. I had no idea. So it was good because all my smart friends are now in student debt. <laughs> oh, it kind of worked out. Yeah, that tends to happen. So in terms of, uh, you know, it's easy to get on Instagram or, or get on Twitter and, and hear someone, um, you know, ragging about school or saying this or that. But what's one, you know, maybe a, a handful of things that maybe you had to, you talked about mindset, maybe, is there anything you had to kind of unlearn from school? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a big one. So in school, I mean, think of the people and, and I'm mainly talking about finances. I'm not talking about world history or freaking calculus or whatever, but think about the person teaching you. If, if your teacher who's making $60,000 a year lives in a, you know, middle-class neighborhood, doesn't have any investments, doesn't drive a nice car. If he's telling you, you need to do this, you need to do that. You need to do this. Where is his experience coming from? Think about that for a second. Where are these teachers teaching based off of? And I always bring it back to the police, right? So if a civilian who's never been in a street fight trying to arrest a guy or, you know, chasing a guy for murder or, you know, catching a, I don't know, a, a somebody, if they're telling me how to affect an arrest, my ears are off. You know, I'm like, I'm not listening to you. But if a fellow police officer tells me, hey, man, you can't do it like this. Do it like this because in my experience, blah, 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 right? And you are the average of the five people you hang out with. I'm sure you guys have heard that, but it really is a lot of truth. So if your circle of five people are people that have done things that you're interested in. So, you know, and, and I really try not to be the smartest dude in the room. I want to be the dumbest because I, I want to learn, absorb, ask questions, and also you're paying for an experience when you hang out with these people. So man, soak that in, in, in like a sponge. So, uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm kind of a example of that is I don't, I, I mean, I'll take your word for it, but show me the proof, show me what you've done. What are you going to bring to this table? It's not because you've read something in some book. It's going to be because, Hey man, I, I invested in this and I, I lost a lot and don't do that. I'm going to listen to that guy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I can definitely attest to that. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting what kind of reading does. It's almost like at times reading can kind of uh, inflate your ego. You know, you see all the little pretty books on your bookshelf and you think you're doing something, but a lot of times it's not until you just set that book aside and go, go start moving, you know, things start to happen. Yeah. Yeah, man. And, and I know people are very calculated and, and they're, they're worried. And I mean, what I did is I consumed, I, I mean, I'm just a, a very kind of, like I said, going back to being grunty, I'm kind of grunty. So I like to do things and just dive in. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'll read one book or two, but other than that, I put the book down. I'm like, let's go. Vamanos. Yeah. And um, uh, so that's, that's what I did. And, and then I feel like anything in my life that I've done, I've always just did it because then I can attest, you know, and, and really be knee deep into whatever I'm doing. Uh, so I would rec tell people stop reading, even watching this. I'm sorry. I know this is your, your views, but stop watching this and go invest, go, go do it instead of just in absorbing the content, you know, cause you, if you absorb too much, you're going to try to convince yourself. Oh, oh, wait, wait, he said this. And, and that's a, that's a risk. So I'm not going to do it. Don't, don't, don't do that. Yep. That's absolutely right. Um, so if you're watching this, turn it off right now. <laughs> oh, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah, no, I, I, I got you. There's a, there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, you know, 
I, I know you mentioned how, you know, while you were you know, in the police force, you were, you know, you're working as a police officer and then also as a realtor. Um, I believe you just recently retired, haven't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, it's been pretty recent. What, a few weeks? Uh, two months. Well, kind of, because to be officially retired, you have to have 20 years. I only did eight, eight years and, and then some. Uh, so I just basically quit, you know, in other words. And there, there is some of the benefits that I, that I get, but I don't I mean, I don't get a check every month. I basically quit to be an entrepreneur. I yeah. said, you know what? I'm not doing this. There's, I'm not going to have no safety net. Um, and, and another life experience is I moved from New York to here in a Jeep. I packed up my, my Jeep Wrangler 06 um, for it's the JK model for you Jeepers out there. Yeah. And I just packed up all my stuff and I drove from New York to Texas and I got here Friday and, you know, applying with the police department back and forth. They uh, started the police academy Monday. So literally I got here Friday and I started the police academy Monday. I mean, I was so culture shocked between New York and San Antonio, Texas. Let me tell you, I cannot find a good bagel out here. And I was like, what the hell do you people eat for breakfast? You can't eat tacos for breakfast, <laughs> but you do. And now I love tacos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, oddly enough, I was, um, I was down in new Orleans visiting some friends a few years ago. Um, and I didn't realize a lot of New Yorkers will move down to New Orleans. Um, and there was, I, the, the name escapes me. I forget the name of the, of the bagel shop, but went mm -hmm. to this bagel shop and this couple from New York owned it and they would import water from New York city because they claim that there's something about the water that makes good bagels. Yep. Is that That's true? what I hear. And you know what? <laughs> I, it may be true. So I, I can, yeah, it, it, there's nothing here that is even close to over there. Yeah, absolutely. So in yeah. terms of culture, I mean, what do you, you know, what, what are some big differences or things that you see, you know, here that you wouldn't see over in New York? Oh, that's a love that question. So when I moved here, I said, wait a minute, how much can you buy a house for? A hundred thousand, 130,000. Are you freaking insane? Why aren't you living in a house? Why, why are you in an apartment? Are you crazy? So I could not believe the fact that people were living in apartments. They're like, oh, well, I don't want to put a down payment on a house. Like, what is wrong with you in New York? If you had a house, you were rich. Like, you just had money. And if you had a parking space, oh, my God, you were freaking, you know, some kind of mayor or something, you know, yeah. or something <laughs> like a hedge fund manager. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it just, the, the living, uh, the cost of living was so manageable for a blue collared worker, uh, which was myself or it really still is myself. Um, so it, um, it, it was very obtainable of a family lifestyle, having a house, a yard, a decent school for, you know, just a blue collar, even one person in the family can work and, and sustain. I thought it was incredible. And it's basically going back in time because, you know, New York was like that, what, 50 years ago? So when I came here, I was like, what the hell? So, and real estate already sparked my interest. So back in 2011, uh, you know, that's when I started. I rented for one year, and then I bought my first piece of real estate. And then, you know, bought many others after that. Okay, very good. So was it... Um you know, during that kind of that little transition there, that's, you know, it seems real small, but for a lot of people, that's huge, you know, just going from renting, you know, only a few square feet worth of an apartment to buying a house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, was there something that told you needed to make that transition? Or how did you go about that? No, so when I was in New York, um, again, I was a 24 year old, just, you know, kid who lived by my, you know, lived had my own apartment, but that apartment I bought, so I bought that apartment uh, for a hundred and I think it was like a hundred thousand and it was a whopping 500 square feet total. I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it was a, basically like a studio apartment anyway. Uh, but for that, it was a good price and it was outside of the city limits. It was in Yonkers. So, um, so I got that. So, and I had no idea about real estate. The only thing I did because I'm a doer, is a, a guy at work who was, you know, married, kids, he's a little bit older. He was in his, you know, 30s, 40s. And he told me, Trey, do not, if you're going to leave your parents' house or parents' apartment, do not rent. 
just buy something. It doesn't matter where it is, just buy it. And I respected this man so much, just his work ethic and, and how he is. I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. That's it. I got one person that told me to buy an apartment and I listened. I just did it. And I had no idea. I, I trusted the loan people, the uh, realtor. I just said, whatever, just get me. A, 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 and it was in my budget. And I said, I'll take it. That's it. Yep. That's how I got started. Sometimes it's all it takes. It just takes, uh, you know, one, one guy's encouraging word, just a little, a little nudge and, and you're there. Yep, absolutely. And, and what I would say, if the, whoever's listening to this, if you did have somebody reach out to you, listen to them, you know, just don't just hear them. Okay. Yeah. You're telling me to buy a house. No, do it, yeah. do it. Start your loan process and you just do it. If you just think of excuses all oh, later, 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 no, you know, you just, you know, you just got to like shake them and just say, do it. You know I mean? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's, um, you know, what's something you're, you're looking forward to in, in, in real estate right now, or what do you, what do you make of the market in San Antonio right now? You know, the market in San Antonio, along with every other, every other major city is kind of similar. We're having a, a national trend of very, very low inventory. You know, it's like, it's like going to, going to the supermarket and, you know, there's 30 people and there's two steaks. You know, you're just going to grab a steak, right? If, if obviously if you want steak. But if there's 30 steaks and two people, then you got can pay, take your time, right? Yeah. And that really correlates in very crayon terms is exactly what's happening in the housing market. You have a lot of buyers because of the great interest rates, because people are realizing it really does matter where you live because the convenience and, and you know, if you outgrew your house or you need to downsize, it really does matter where you live. And I think that's why we're having overabundance of buyers and we have very low inventory. Yep. So at, at um, you know, the, the word correction kind of gets thrown around a little bit. So when do you think, um, you know, when do you think we will eventually have enough inventory to meet, to meet the amount of buyers? I think it's going to take um, possibly the government to step in and to create easier ways for people to build homes. You know, you, you need, you need uh, tax benefits for bigger businesses to create jobs. You need neighborhoods, you need um, amenities, commercial uh, shopping strips, you know, for people to get their goods. Uh, you need a lot of the infrastructure and it, just the easier you make it, the more incentivized these small businesses like myself are willing to build and invest their money and, you know, create just living arrangements, better living arrangements. So the more inventory you create, it, it neutralizes itself. Go back to my super, supermarket analogy. If you start packing up the steaks, then people are going to be like, okay, well, there's 30 steaks and there's 30 people in the supermarket. So we're good now. Yeah. And if people can concentrate on their families and, yeah. There you go. No, it, um, it's interesting because it, it kind of seems like prior to the coronavirus, you know, hitting the economy was moving in one direction. And, and now it's almost like there's been a lot of different, um, the, it seems like the real estate market's kind of moving in a lot of different directions and it's become, um, you know, it kind of seems like sometimes some people, you know, before were flocking to the downtown areas. Now people want more space, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. There really is a, a shift in, in rural areas. And, um, you know, I don't think the rural community is, was really uh, ready for it. They're like, man, we got one supermarket. We got one stoplight. We got <laughs> that for the whole town. <laughs> you know? yeah. And there's so many buyers and there's, you know, uh, I was very used to being uh, landlocked in, in New York, you know, in New York, there's, there's nothing, there's no such thing as, Oh, we have built a new community and you know, we're pick your plan, pick your no, there's nothing like that. Yeah. If you want to buy something, you gotta buy and you gotta tear it down and then build up, right? Yeah. So seeing that when I was growing up, I mean, I guess I remembered, and now in areas like San Antonio and surrounding areas, when I see underdeveloped land, I'm thinking, hey, you know, now is the time to buy, get your assets in order and hold them until the value comes up or 
you know, invest, build and make your money move. Yep, absolutely. It, um, you know, the Texas economy has a lot going on. We just found out the other day about Tesla being official here in Austin. Yep. Uh, San Antonio has just exploded over the past, you know, 10, 15 years, it seems. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that, that Tesla announcement is huge. So now, for you listening out there, think of the suburbs around Austin. You know, if, if I don't know if your group is hyper-local, but uh, think of Kyle, Buda, all those areas in Braunfels. That's all that is going to come, come this way because I'm sure people are going to be like, well, I want to work at Tesla, but I don't mind driving an hour. You know, I'm sure they'll have work from home, partial, you know, whatever to accommodate. But, you know, think, think outside the box. Don't think, you know, this company is moving to this big area. I'm going to buy in this big area. No, yeah. think, of, think of the veins that come out of the artery, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, um, you know, had you, had you told me about working from home back in January, I wouldn't know what the heck you're talking about because I never did it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it's interesting how, it, how working from home is kind of changing a bit of the consumer behavior, you know? Yeah. It really has, and um, it, you know, uh, another theory that I was talking to a friend, he said that a lot of the increased buyers are now because people are saving on gas. You know, these employers are forced to, uh, to pay, hey, just don't come to work. So now you don't have to pack a lunch. Now you don't have to eat out. Now you don't have gas. You have maybe less car insurance. Maybe you'll downsize to one vehicle. You know, so all those economics, in, in their family budgets are, you know, multiplying thousands. So it does have an effect. I mean, look, it had an effect on the oil. Oil was, you know, was, was kind of pricey last year. And then now it's, you could freaking drive to Canada for like 10 bucks. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's right. No, I, I couldn't believe when oil went negative back in, what was it? March, April. Yep. Yeah. But, um, so what, what's next for San Antonio? Where do you kind of see, um, again, with San Antonio, it's hard to see if the city's going to get wider or if more people are looking infill in the you know metro area. So it is definitely going to get wider. There's a lot of development uh, that's coming on the northeast side. Um, the big, uh, you guys know H-E-B in Austin. So H-E-B is a, a very big retail chain here in, in the South Texas area. And love HEB, by the way. <laughs> but they bought 230,000 acres going east towards Houston for the uh, I-10 corridor. So now these custom home builders are, and just regular uh, kind of the cookie cutter builders are building communities along the I-10 area. And then that's veining off north and south from going east. So it really is spreading out. And these, these big ranches you know, um, they're kind of getting tired of, of the, uh, of the congestion now. Obviously they're used to, you know, dirt roads and which I don't blame them. I wish I lived on a dirt road, but anyway, a lot of them are up and moving or, you know, the families are getting older. So, um, it, it's, it's, it is a lot of movement that's happening and man, I can't stress enough to just start capitalizing on that, you know, look for opportunity, not in your circle of, close-minded people or folks that are not open talking about investments, opportunity, um, and, and different ideas, you know, and, um, and, and execute. That's the biggest thing. It's just, you need to execute. Yeah. You know, um, you, you kind of reminded me a bit of, uh, you know, what my grandpa used to tell me about the five people you spend the most time around. But um, I mean, you can kind of attest to this yourself, but, you know, let's say you just got to a new city, you're the new kid on the block. Um, maybe you haven't had the, the best um, support group, or maybe you don't know anybody in your city. You know, how do you, how do you find those like-minded people that want to go where, where you, you want to go? Man, Facebook. Facebook, uh, there's, there's meetings, go to coffee shops. I mean, honestly, online is, is the best. You know, just find these community um, So like, let's say San Antonio, San Antonio investors, San Antonio, and spend time with these people. Uh, say, sir, uh, sir, ma'am, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Can I take you out to lunch? Can, can I just follow you for the two hours this week? You know, it, it just takes initiative. You know, uh, when, when I broke out, again, going back to my police, when I broke out, I'm the new guy, right? Nobody likes me. Everyone's like, oh, it's freaking boot. You know, you're, uh, they would say, oh, 
my boots have been on the job longer than you. I have more tears than, you know, whatever. I don't know they would say dumb. <laughs> yeah. But I had to kind of prove myself, but I've always been the person that needed to be held back and scale. Hey man, calm down. You know, and uh, I would out there be working and, and looking for bad guys and looking at the warrant list and, and the, the senior guys, hey, calm down. But that's the kind of mindset and initiative and execution that everybody needs. It's not just the military or first responder world. You need to do that in, in investing. Be the guy that's like, oh, sir, do you, do you need me to go with you? Can I, can I tag along? If you don't show that initiative, even me, you know, now investing in a couple of properties and flipped and uh, buying holds, if a kid comes to me and I say kid just, you know, for this, what we're talking about, if a kid comes to me and says, Trey, can I, can I just sit in the car with you next time you leave your house and, you know, doing business, of course, I would say, okay, but I'm not going to take time to pull somebody in and teach them about uh, how I find my investments, you know, my, uh, the, the way I, I get clients to buy houses, my follow-up procedures, my templates. Like, I'm not going to just share that with anybody, but you need to prove yourself. And if that starts, you don't have to be the smartest, the fastest, but um, you, you, you need to start somewhere. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it just uh, almost kind of just starts with a leap of faith and some initiative, you know? Oh, yeah. So what was, um, I, I know you talked a bit about investing. What was your... Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, what was your first investment deal and uh, how did you find it? Sure. So, um, well, actually, my first one was the apartment I bought in New York. I bought it for about 100000 and in 2009, mid-crash. I mean, like I said, I was not the smartest kid. I didn't even know the crash was happening. <laughs> and I, I bought it at one hundred. <laughs> then it dropped down to $50,000. But luckily, I held it for 10 years. I moved out of New York and moved to Texas. So, I just used it as a rental. Yeah. Um, and then it finally came up to about 125,000. So, um, uh, that was my first investment. It was a bad investment, obviously, because it dipped down and then it came back up, but I walked away with 56,000. So I walked away with 56,000. I owned it for 10 years. Had I been smart about it and, you know, learned, but either way I paid for an experience, right? So now my, uh, second property was a property here locally in, in the San Antonio suburbs. And it was Opportunity Knox, right? Um, I'm, I'm married with two kids. So uh, a friend of ours said, hey, uh, they, they knew I was a realtor. I said, hey, the, the house down the street is beautiful. I think my wife wants to buy it. But they had to sell their house before they bought that one. So I told them, hey, uh, can you sell it to me? Because I've been to their house. But had I not just jumped on it, they could have put it on the market, you know, with me and sold it on the market for a little bit higher. But I told them, I said, Hey, let me just, you don't have to deal with showings. You don't have to repair anything. I'll figure it out. You know, just tell it to me as is, you know, let me walk through it and, and I'll just hold it as a rental. I didn't, at the time I didn't have 20% down, but I called a lender. I begged, I said, please give me a loan for this. I just, I just want to park my money somewhere. I do have 15% down. Uh, they sold to me for 115 or 120,000, I think. So um, about, let's say 30,000 out of pocket, you know, plus their loan fees. So anyway, but it was so fast. It was pretty much in two days that we got under contract. Me and my wife never talked about investing that, that week or ready for it. We just had the money. So what I'm saying is it takes that execution. It takes that risk. Mark Twain said, you can't get the fruit without going on a limb. So you have to really just go out. And as soon as you see it, you, you have to take it. You, you have to just go for it. And if you fall on your face, that's okay. It's okay to pay for an experience. It's never wasted money when you pay for an experience. Yeah, no, I, I really liked what you said about, you know, that paying for that experience. It kind of seems like you're going to pay either way. You pay for the missed opportunity and just having your hands in your pockets doing nothing. Or, you know, maybe you, maybe you scrape your knee, but you, you pay either way. Yep. Oh, yep. yeah. I agree. Absolutely. So, what's, uh, so what's next for you? What are, are you looking to um, kind of continue more of the deals that you're doing or, or scaling, scaling your business or what, what, what's next? 
So I'm, I'm doing both. So I'm developing a real estate app that uh, is for realtors. It's, uh, it's coming out probably in the next few months. I think it's going to be really, really well. It's, it's, going, it's a great concept. I can't share it yet because it's not public, but I think it's going to be amazing. The second thing I'm doing is I'm also scaling my rentals. So I'm a big fan of buy and holds. There's uh, five ways to make money on buy and holds. It's a slow play. It is not this fast pants so I flip. You know, if you really boil down flips, I know it's such a pop popular thing. Not going into formulas or anything, but you're, you're acquiring, a, acquiring a risk. Then you're renovating it and the, and the time you sell it, you're involving other people, then you have to uh, finance it or have the buyer finance it. So it, to me, that's a lot of time for a short amount of gain. Even though it's 20,000, 30,000 or, or more, to me, it's, it, it does, I do not want that. What I want is I want to park money somewhere where it slowly goes up. Um, goodness, I can't think of his name. The freaking richest man, one of the richest men in the world. Oh my God. Stock guy. What's his name? Uh, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. Yeah. He, uh, he said in, a, in, a, in an interview or he was teaching something, he said, you know, with investing, think of it like a punch card. He's like 100 years old. So I guess he thinks of punch cards. <laughs> no offense, Warren. We're buddies. Love you, man. So he says, if you do a punch card with, with six uh, in, uh, investments, he's like, once you run out, that is what you have to stick to. If you start buying stocks and then uh, doing a 401k and then buying real estate and then have your money everywhere, those experiences that you've paid for, because there's risk with everything, are not going to give you the most gain because you've now learned something that you can build on, but you cannot lose that lesson. And you can't just blow it off like, you know, just apologizing and, and oh man, that's screwed up. You didn't screw up. You just learned something and you gotta focus on what you learned on. Yep, that's definitely true. It's, um, it's kind of easy to kind of let those negative ruminating thoughts get in your head and then it prevents you from taking action in the future but that's definitely something yeah to do. yeah well that's exciting about your app and you have um and you have a lot going on yeah yeah and uh, i'm also in, in san antonio is becoming very difficult to find good properties to buy and hold so i'm looking in louisiana right now um <clears throat> different little towns around new orleans i feel like new orleans like like we talked about you know, the people that are congested in one little historic or, you know, city-like area, they're going to want to go to the suburbs. So now I'm uh, under contract in a, in a house in Louisiana. Wow. How about that? So do you have any sort of ties to Louisiana or why, why Louisiana? Nope. nope. Yeah. Just research. Yeah. Property taxes are low. You know, it's, uh, it's, it retains people very well. It's not a, a state that people usually move out of. The climate's great. The food is wonderful. There's a lot of, um, you know, outdoor activities, fishing, crabbing, crawfish, obviously the music, the people are extremely friendly. Um, <clears throat> so I, I did visit there, but uh, I, I'm in love with it. And it's not, it should never be emotional about what you invest in. I don't care if it's in, you know, freaking random ass town in Canada, if it's a hundred thousand dollar property and I can cash flow $2,000, you bet your ass I'm buying them. Yeah. You know, I don't care where it is. I don't even have to see it. As long as the numbers work, it is always about the market, not the property. About the market, not the property. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, especially now because, you know, kind of how we talked about with all these different economic factors, um, kind of consumer behavior has been changing. It's almost like, you know, you as, as an investor and an agent have to be creative, more creative now than ever before. Absolutely, yeah. It, it is harder to find deals, but they're out there everywhere. Even in, I mean, big cities that don't have good rental ratios, but it's, it's out there, man. You, you just got to boot, boots on ground. Don't be afraid of confrontation and don't be afraid to pay for that experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, is there, um, that's about all I've got for now. I mean, is there, is there anything that you'd like to say that you, that you haven't, that you'd like to really hit home? You know, uh, if you took the time to listen to this entire 
uh, episode or uh, video, you need to execute. I mean, I cannot have your mindset and, and think that you need to just not have doubts, practice positivity, practice gratitude. Whatever you have in life, if you live in a shack, you know, you have your health. If, if, you, if you need more, stop asking for what you want and, and this whole dream home BS. Stop at the dream home. It's the right home for you right now. And the last thing is I value in, empowering people. Empowering people is probably one of my favorite things to do uh, in, in, in being a paramedic, being a cop. I love empowering people with knowledge. So find what value you have or what you like to do and then have your goal towards it because that makes it easier. You know, I mean, I can go on about this, but have your value, have what you like and then have your goal towards that. So mine is empowering. And then the byproduct of empowering is making a lot of money. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. So, um, where can we find you? Are you on, are you on social media or do you have a website? Where can, where can people find oh, yeah. you? I'm everywhere. Just Google Trey Serrano and I am there. Uh, Facebook is at Trey Serrano. My Instagram handle is at Trey Serrano Realtor. And uh, I have a, a, a real estate group called uh, the Cavalry Group. All, most of us are first responders or veterans. We invest, we help people buy and sell. We create content around it. It's kind of funny content because, you know, we're all first responders, we're all kind of grunty. So uh, we're very, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very focused and kind of niche. There's no BS, no fluff. And um, I, I think that's, I mean, that's just the environment that I live in. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, that's what we need. All right, Trey, well, thank you so much. Um, Thanks for was, having me, Aaron. I really, really appreciate it. And, and, you know, my heart goes out to everybody watching this. I love everybody and I love you, Aaron. I appreciate it. Love you too, man. Appreciate the, uh, appreciate the chat. That was real informative. And um, I'll, put, I'll put your link in the description and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yes. And anybody needs help out there, just, just let me know. Uh, this, I'm an entrepreneur. So I don't have a W-2 job anymore. So just reach out and we'll, we'll get you going. Absolutely, Trey. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. Have a good one.